morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the 12th Annual Pikes Peak Regional History Symposium, Military Matters, Defense, Development, and Descent in the Pikes Peak Region. Uh, I'm Tim Blevins, and I'm with Special Collections, which is the Regional History and Genealogy Collection downtown in Penrose Library. Um, thank you all for attending today's event. And we'd also like to thank those who are viewing us through our Ustream channel online. Uh, we're very grateful for our sponsors for this year's uh, History Symposium, and that includes the Helen and James McCaffrey Fund for Regional History, uh, the Friends of the Pikes Peak Library Districts, the Pikes Peak Library District Foundation, and the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. Uh, we're also thankful to have representatives of the Gold Star Mothers and Gold Star Wives who provided photographs of their fallen loved ones for the moving exhibit that Special Collections photo archivist Bill Thomas uh, curated and installed in the hallway just outside of this room. Uh, thank you for allowing us to um, recognize your sacrifices and to honor our fallen heroes in their, for, for their ultimate sacrifice. Um, Bill? As Tim said, we are very honored today to have five very special guests with us, and those are the Gold Star Mothers of the Pikes Peak chapter. So before we go any further, we'd like to recognize and thank each of them for being here today. So I'm going to introduce them one at a time and ask them to stand so we can see them and thank them. So moms will begin down here first with Cleo Allgood, mother of Colonel Brian Allgood, United States Army. Next, Terry Chapman, mother of Tech Sergeant John Chapman, United States Air Force. Next, Esteline Miller, mother of Staff Sergeant Justin Whiting, United States Army. Next, Patricia O'Kane Trombley, mother of Captain Thomas Gremeth, United States Air Force. And last, Sylvia Bonaconti, mother of Chief Warrant Officer Frank Bonaconti, United States Army. And Sylvia is also the president of the Pikes Peak chapter. And more than anyone else, she is responsible for pulling together the photographs that you see in that exhibit down to the hall to the left. And if you haven't seen it, please do so while you're here today. You'll find it very moving indeed. Um, so what I'd like to do on behalf of all of us here, Sylvia, is to invite you up to stage. And we have a plaque for you. I'd like to read it. To the Pikes Peak chapter, American Gold Star Mothers, with our deepest respect and appreciation for your extraordinary sacrifice, service, and support to our nation and our community, Pikes Peak Library District, Colorado Springs, June 6, 2015. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I did neglect to thank Vicki, who is here. Um, she's from the Colorado Springs Chapter of Hearing Loss Association of America, and she's been uh, assisting folks with the um, T-coil equipment. Thanks, Vicki. So how many of you here today are in active service? A few. Um, how many have served? Keep your hands up. Uh, Thank you very much for your service. Okay. So go ahead and keep your hands up. I, I want to see it, how this fills out. Um, how many of you are a military spouse? OK. I uh, have a parent, sibling, child, friend, ancestor who served in the military. <laughs> okay. OK. So we can see that almost everyone is, is personally affected by military with family members or friends uh, who participated. Uh, today's symposium presenters will engage us in dialogue about what it means to have a strong military presence in the region and how it has influenced and defined our community. Uh, the presentations span centuries in time and reveal a wide spectrum of opinion. Uh, we're not here to debate or defend personal positions but rather to better understand the complex history and relationships unique to the Pikes Peak region. Uh, we're privileged today to have great speakers from the area, uh, as well as um, 
uh, fantastic speakers from other parts of the country, including Newton, Kansas, Princeton, New Jersey, and Pullman, Washington. And uh, one of the handouts you should have received is a little booklet, and their, their bios are in here for the speakers. Uh, so if you want to know more about them, uh, this is the place to go. Uh, We appreciate all of their uh, efforts in preparing for today and, and sharing their scholarship and their experiences with us. Um, we also have a survey that uh, we included in your packet today. Uh, it's very helpful for us to get your feedback. Uh, there's a box outside the door. Uh, if you could just drop uh, your uh, sur survey, survey in there before you leave today, that would be very helpful to us. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker and the event MC, uh, Dr. Michael L. Olson. Dr. Olson is a professor emeritus at New Mexico Highlands University, where he taught a variety of American history courses in, from 1973 to 2002. Uh, from 2003 to 2007, he taught full-time at Pikes Peak Community College, and he holds the BA from St. Olaf College and the MA and PhD from the University of Washington. Dr. Olson has long had a connection with the Santa Fe Trail and the Santa Fe Trail Association. Uh, he's published extensively on trail history, especially regarding social aspects of mo and multicultural issues. Uh, Mike has often participated in, in the production of the Regional History Symposia uh, and, and our publications as a researcher, presenter, moderator, author, and editor. Uh, please help me welcome Mike Olson. Thanks, Tim. The title here says it all, what I'm going to talk about. Me Encontra Seis Americanos, the Spanish military expedition that changed the history of the Southwest. What my story is about is a moment in time, really a moment in time. We're going to get to midnight on November 13th, 1821, when the history of the world changed, okay? Well, at least North America. <laughs> and we're going to find out that although one side spoke Spanish and the other side spoke English, they had to speak French to each other, okay. Uh, um, the story has two protagonists. The first is Don Pedro Ignacio Gallego, only this isn't him. Uh, <laughs> we don't have a picture of Don Pedro. Uh, this is a, a rendition, an artist's rendition of a Spanish caballero um, uh, as a poster for uh, a meeting that the Santa Fe Trail Association is participating in this September um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, we don't know when Don Pedro was born. Uh, we do know that he was born in Santa Cruz de la Cañada, New Mexico, uh, largely because when he was about 20 years old, he petitioned the Bishop of Durango to please annul the uh, engagement that his parents had made to a lady in Santa Cruz de la Cañada. Uh, um, it goes on and on with these Spanish documents, okay? Uh, Don Pedro was alcalde, sort of like the mayor of Abiquiu, well before George O'Keefe moved there uh, um, in uh, the 1820s and 1830s. And Alcalde, as I say, sort of like a mayor, but it also had a military function, as we'll be seeing. Uh, we have no idea when he died or where he died, but he did change the history of the Southwest. Our other protagonist is a man named William Becknell. This isn't him either, okay? <laughs> um, it's sort of an artist's rendering of a Santa Fe trader, as it says. We do know more about Becknell. He's born in Virginia, uh, emigrates to Missouri in 1810, is a veteran of an early war of the United States, the War of 1812, and he's known as the father of, Sa of the Santa Fe Trail, and that's what I'm going to be talking about, a meeting between Becknell and Gallego that leads to the foundation of the Santa Fe Trail, and the Santa Fe Trail is a trail of commerce and conquest. We'll end up in about 12 minutes, I hope, uh, uh, with uh, Stephen Watts Kearney, um, who led the American Army of the West down the Santa Fe Trail in 1846 and on to California. Um, and we added the Southwest to the United States. But it starts with this meeting between Gallego and Becknell. Um, Becknell emigrates to Texas in 1835. He fights in the Texas War of Independence, and he dies in Clarksville, Texas in 1865. And uh, just last week, his gravesite was um, dedicated by the Santa Fe Trail Association. It was found in the weeds in Clarksville, Texas, and we rescued William Becknell. <laughs> a little bit of housework before we talk about these two men again. Uh, let's take a look at the political situation in North America, uh, particularly here in the Southwest in 1821. In 1821, 
the Arkansas River is an international boundary. South of the Arkansas, at the beginning of 1821, is the Spanish Empire. Uh, in December of 1821, uh, Mexico wins its independence from Spain, and uh, so south of the um, Arkansas becomes the Republic of Mexico. It remains that uh, then until 1846. So the period we're talking about, William Becknell, an American, has strayed into, he might have been an illegal immigrant, you never know, uh, strayed into uh, uh, Spanish territory and could have been arrested and killed as earlier uh, people were because the Spanish had a closed colonial system. They didn't want anybody to come in. But when the Mexicans won their independence, the, the gates were thrown open for trade, and he just happened to be the first one on the scene, as we'll be seeing. Now this, of course, has a tremendous impact on us in Colorado, and I can never resist doing this, okay? You go south of the Arkansas here, and it's Spanish, okay? We've got Pueblo, we've got Las Animas, we've got Baca County, named after an early legislator in uh, uh, this state, Felipe Baca. Uh, we've got um, Bent County, although it's not a Spanish name, it is uh, William Bent, who founded Bent's Fort and was instrumental with his brother Charles Bent in adding the Southwest to the United States and dealing with Plains uh, native peoples. Um, it goes on and on as I've got up here, all the way down to El Paso. And folks, I'm not going to translate El Paso for you. Um, if I used to ask students, why is it called El Paso County? <laughs> what do you suppose El Paso means? <laughs> What pass is it? <laughs> anyway, uh, um, so we're talking about a time in American history when this wasn't south of the Arkansas, was not the United States. Um, and what we're talking about is that moment in time which leads to it becoming part of the United States. Just a quick look at the Santa Fe Trail itself. Santa Fe Trail opens with William Becknell in 1821 when he meets Gallego, as we'll be seeing. Um, and essentially, it lasts until 1880 when a branch railroad of the Atchison, and Topeka and Santa Fe uh, uh, chugs into Santa Fe, New Mexico. And there's no need for wagon transport anymore. Um, it was mainly a road of commerce. It was not a settlement road. It, I'm going to have to watch my time here because I get off on the Santa Fe Trail. It's not the Oregon Trail, folks, okay? <laughs> this is not Little Yano on the Prairie. Uh, this is um, traders. Um, by the 1830s, there are two or three million dollars worth of goods going back and forth on the Santa Fe Trail. There are hundreds of firms and traders involved. Um, over half of them are Hispanics from New Mexico. Uh, it's a multicultural trail. It's a two-way trail. It's a trail, as I say, of commerce um, and conquest. Um, there are two branches of the trail, the mountain route, uh, which goes along the Arkansas to uh, essentially what's now La Junta, and then to Trinidad and over Raton Pass, and the um, Cimarron route, which goes through the Oklahoma Panhandle. The preferred route was the Cimarron because you got to Santa Fe earlier and you could sell your goods to eager people, uh, but um, there was a water problem there. So um, after 1846 in particular, when the army started shipping millions and millions and tens of thousands of tons of freight along the Santa Fe Trail, they preferred the mountain route uh, for, to La Junta and then to Trinidad. Okay, we're gonna reverse it now. We started with Becknell, or we started with Gallego and then it was Becknell. Now we're gonna take a look at uh, uh, Becknell. Um, and Becknell left Franklin, Missouri. He was a frontier storekeeper um, and rogue. Uh, when he left in 1821 for Santa Fe, um, there was a warrant out for his arrest because he hadn't paid his bills. Um, but he goes with five companions. Uh, they have pack horses. This picture happens to be a pack mules, uh, but uh, uh, the idea is the same. Uh, they have pack horses, and um, they don't know where Santa Fe is, but they're hoping that it's open to trade. They just figure if you go far enough west and far enough south, you're going to get to Santa Fe. Uh, um, one of the items that he carried was manufactured cloth from England, the whole Industrial Revolution. Uh, take a class on this. Um, and um, 
of course, in Santa Fe, it was either buckskin or homespun uh, from sheep or cotton that was raised in the area. He made, as I show up here, a lot of money, okay, and came back again um, in 1822 and in 1823. Um, and he meets up then, as I say, with uh, Gallego, as we'll be seeing. In 1823, after his second trip to Santa Fe, he wrote up his experiences for the Missouri Intelligencer newspaper. And here we have uh, a, a short paragraph from that. And I want to particularly emphasize two things. One, he starts on Tuesday morning, the 13th. We had the satisfaction of meeting with a party of Spanish troops. Although the difference of our language would not admit of conversation, yet the circumstances attending their reception of us fully convinced us of their hospitable disposition and friendly feelings. Gallego had 445 troops with him. Most of them were uh, uh, Indian auxiliaries that he picked up from the Pueblos. They've got shields and spears. There are six people in uh, 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 Becknell's party. As we'll be seeing in a second, he's right at the foot of the Sangre de Cristos, where there's a pass. And he and his men, I'm getting a little fanciful, are looking there, and all of a sudden, 445 armed men come through that pass. And he says, holy, well, you know. Uh, um, uh, so, um, uh, but he finds that they're friendly, and, and, and that's important. And then at the end of this, it says, fortunately, I here met with a Frenchman, and we'll be talking about that um, in a second. Now we turn to Gallego. Gallego's up in Abiquiu. He's alcalde. In October, he gets a message from the governor of New Mexico, Facundo Magares, who, by the way, escorted Zebulon Pike from Santa Fe to Chihuahua to Texas in 1807. Oh, this is such, such interesting stuff, okay. So Magadis has met Americans, okay. But Magadis says to Gallego, hey, take a bunch of guys from Abiquiu. You are you're head of the Militia Urbana, the city police, uh, the, 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 the uh, um, National Guard, so to speak. Take them, uh, some Navajos have raided Spanish settlements along the Rio Grande. So he heads for western New Mexico. Then he gets another uh, a, a letter from uh, Malgada saying, whoa, the Comanches have raided San Miguel del Vado over on the Pecos, you go over there. So he picks up more Indian auxiliaries, he goes over there, and he's marching out onto the eastern plains um, in search of these uh, Comanche, okay? This is his record of his expedition, okay? Diario, it's, it's like a... You, all these military people in here, okay? The Spanish, you think Americans are bad at triplicate and quadruplicate? The Spanish just, you, you had to write up everything, okay? Thank goodness uh, for historians. Um, very quickly, this document laid undiscovered from 1821 until 1992 when um, a friend of mine and I found it um, in the Spanish archives by looking, of New Mexico by looking at a catalog and we saw, oh, this guy went out on the plains about the time Becknell was coming. And gee whiz, uh, maybe they met up. And they did. There's, uh, when I found this in the New Mexico Highlands University Library, I was heard to go, woo, 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 okay? Because we knew Becknell had gone, but we didn't know how many men he had with them or anything like this. So up there, it says, left Ojo Bernal about 9 a.m., followed the use of formation. About 3.30 p.m., we encountered six Americans at the Puerta Cito de Piedra Lumbre. Uh, that means Flintstone Gap. They parlayed with me, and about 4 p.m., we halted at a stream at Piedra Lumbre, not understanding their words, nor any of the signs they made. They tried Indian sign language, but Betnell only knows Osage, and the people with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Gallego probably only know Comanche, okay, and they just couldn't communicate. Not understanding of their words or the signs they made, I decided to return to El Vado, San Miguel del Vado, in the service of your excellency. At this point, Vicente Villanueva presented himself. Nothing further occurred, I love the way, you know. Nothing further occurred, the history of the world just changed, but. Uh, <laughs> and that is the document over there. Um, I got to touch it in the archives of New Mexico. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the vaults of Fort Knox are easily broken into compared to the archives uh, of New Mexico. <laughs> I had to put on a glove and it's got to touch it. Okay. Uh, this site is um, uh, uh, marked today. It's been marked by the um, uh, 
state of New Mexico. Um, uh, this friend of mine and I who found this document were instrumental in getting them to market in Spanish and in English. And also it's been marked by the um, Daughters of the American Revolution. The Daughters of the American Revolution in 1905 marked the whole Santa Fe Trail with 103 markers from Missouri uh, to New Mexico. And when they found that we had located the spot where uh, uh, this fateful meeting had occurred, uh, they marked it also. And I want to talk at this point, since you can see where it is, about the fateful meeting. So Gallego's there, and he's got five companions. Um, here comes Pedro Ignacio Gallego with his troops, okay? Nobody can understand anybody, okay? So there, here it gets a, a little bit, there isn't any documentation, so I get to make it up, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, we know that they can't understand each other, um, and so it's late in the afternoon. Uh, Gallego says we, we camped there at uh, Piedro Lumbre, the, the, the stream. Um, so I sort of see them as, oh, we've got the f campfires going, and everybody's uh, eating a little, uh, can't eat buffalo, it's in the wrong part of the country. Uh, um, but, but they're partaking of whatever. Um, and then they go to sleep. Imagine... Becknell and his five companions, there are 445 of them around here, okay? Shouldn't we go to sleep or not? But okay, so they're read it, read it, wrapped up in their bedrolls. And meanwhile, Gallego has sent back to uh, uh, San Miguel de Alvado for this Vicente Villanueva that I mentioned. We know from other documentation that Vicente Villanueva spoke French. French was the lingua franca, the, it was the, the language that everybody on the frontier spoke because of the fur trade, okay? All the way from the French in, in French Canada to, to, to the Pacific Ocean. So this Vicente Villanueva comes to the campground. San Miguel de Bado is about 20 miles away. The, the Spanish had about six horses with them. One guy rides, and they ride back, okay? So, so, and this is the part I like, okay? Vicente Villanueva arrives, and I see the six Americans sleeping there, and so he goes around, and he says, Parlez-vous Francais? <laughs> Parlez-vous Francais? <laughs> Parlez-vous... Mais oui, je le parle! Oh. <laughs> History changes, okay? <laughs> At midnight on the plains of New Mexico, in French, this is a fateful meeting, okay? The military expedition that changed the history of the Southwest. And then we end up with this becoming American territory, and this is Stephen Watt, General Stephen Watts Carney. This really is him, okay? Um, and of course, in 1846, he came down the uh, Santa Fe Trail, as I said earlier, with the U.S. Army of the West, and he took possession of the South, excuse me, the Southwest, in Las Vegas, New Mexico. By the way, if you're a traveler, you can visit that site I just showed you that's marked. It's about a mile south of Las Vegas, off of a frontage road, um, and it's, it's eerie, it's so cool. It's also about half a mile from the jail, which we affectionately refer to as the Inn on the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but you can visit it, okay? Kearney declared the Southwest American in August of 1846 from the top of a building still standing on the plaza in Las Vegas. There he is, up there, okay, on the Casa de Musica building. The buildings to his right were not built at that particular time. Um, so because of the Santa Fe Trail being established at that moment in time between Gallego and Becknell, and then serving as a road of commerce and conquest, the territory south of uh, the Arkansas becomes part of the United States. So, I want you to remember the next time you cross the Arkansas, the next time you're whizzing to Santa Fe, Albuquerque, or your winter home in Tucson, okay? Becknell and Gallego, the military expedition that changed the history of the Southwest. Thank you. Okay, as those of you who have been here before remember, I'm also the MC for the program, okay? And so my formal part is over. <laughs> and I can have fun now. Um, and I'm gonna be introducing people. Um, but on a serious note, uh, as Tim asked uh, about people and active service and that sort of thing, 
Um, this is the 71st anniversary of D-Day. And I would like us to stand and have 15 seconds of silence, if we're able, please. Thank you. I was just thinking my father was stationed in England on D-Day. He was a machinist in the Seabees. He had a friend who knew how to fly planes and they got up one mor that morning and everybody was gone from the base. So he and the friend got in a plane and flew over to France to see what was going on. <laughs> it's the dumbest thing I ever did in my life. <laughs> Um, as I say, I'll be the MC. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any cell phones, please uh, silence them. I want to point to Doris here. Doris is our timekeeper. Um, if any of the speakers begins to run over, Doris stands up and screams at them. <laughs> she does, okay? Okay. So our first speaker or second speaker is Susan Fletcher. Uh, she's going to speak on, on how the Civil War built Colorado Springs. Susan is a historian and archivist for the Navigators. She received her MA in public history from Indiana University, Purdue University of Indianapolis. She's the co-author of the book Dawson Trotman in his own words and writes uh, for the Colorado Collective. She served as the vice chair of the Colorado Springs Historic Preservation Board. In addition to her career in history, Fletcher is involved in the local music and arts community and recently had her first solo art show through the Pikes Peak Library District. Please welcome Susan. Growing up in Colorado Springs, the Civil War always seemed so far away to me, both in time and geographical space. I mean, without Civil War sites around, it's kind of easy to think, did that war actually really happen? After graduate school, I moved to Southeast Tennessee, where suddenly Civil War history was all around me. I took hikes on Lookout Mountain and explored Chickamauga, and somewhere in those ramblings, I encountered a name that was very familiar to me, William Jackson Palmer. Living in the region where he and his men fought made me more interested in his Civil War career because heretofore I had just known mostly about his involvement in Colorado Springs. So this topic has actually been a long time in coming for me. This is a marriage of Palmer's Civil War career with the actual founding of Colorado Springs. So the Civil War had a huge impact on the development of the American West. And today we're going to look at that broad historical trend by focusing on a microcosm of that, um, the founding of Colorado Springs itself. We're going to look at ways in which the war impacted the Colorado Territory, how it shaped the group of men who founded the city, and how war veterans continued to be influential citizens in the region until well into the 20th century. So this is a map of uh, the United States in 1861. It's pretty different from the map that Mike just showed us. Um, you can see the Colorado Territory, and then you can see the, the northern and southern states out there. Um, in February 1861, the Colorado Territory was organized just two and a half months before the war began. The majority of non-Indian settlers had come from northern territories or free ter northern states or free territories, about 70 percent, but 30 percent uh, had come from the south. William Gilpin, the federal territorial governor, was concerned that about a third of the population of Denver and the mining camps might be secessionists. Um, as men returned home during the war to fight on their chosen sides, the population of the Colorado Territory declined. In the Pikes Peak region, the population of Colorado City steadily dropped after 1860, although nearby valleys did fill with settlers. Colorado did raise regiments that fought in northern New Mexico and engaged with battles with the Indians, but the region itself was largely isolated from the chaos of war. According to Irving Halbert, during the Civil War, the methods of communication with the East were very slow and oftentimes very inadequate. During the later period of the war, a telegraph line was constructed to Julesburg, which is about 200 miles east of Denver. And the news came in from that point to Denver by coach. So by the time it reached Colorado City, news about the war was already 10 days old, contributing to a sense of isolation. Meanwhile, in Philadelphia, 
A young man named William Jackson Palmer, uh, who was a Quaker, had made the difficult decision to enter the Union Army. For him, the moral wrong of slavery outweighed the moral wrong of war. And like many of the good men of his day, he decided to raise uh, a regiment of troops to fight alongside him. Palmer's objective was to form a company of active, intelligent young men of good standing in their respective communities through the state of Pennsylvania, who would be capable of performing any military service required of them. So in October of November, 1861, he raised an independent company called the Anderson Troop. One of these recruits was a man named uh, Henry McAllister, who was born in Kent County, Delaware, just three days before Palmer was in 1836. McAllister joined the troop as a private, eventually getting promoted to the rank of major. So I'm gonna talk for just a few minutes about the war, and I won't go into a lot of details about troop movements or battles. Like my Civil War history professor, I don't do war. Um, so if you wanna learn about that, there's some excellent resources for that. I'll just give you a brief account. Palmer had a very colorful career in the war. In July of 1862, he received orders to recruit a full regiment, the 15th Pennsylvania Volunteer Cavalry, known as the Anderson Cavalry. Uh, he was very successful. He recruited 1,200 men in only 10 days. After the Battle of Antietam, he crossed into enemy territory where he was taken prisoner on September 18, 1862, the day after his birthday. Although he had several close calls at being discovered, uh, he was eventually released on a prisoner exchange in February of 1863. He returned to find his regiment in chaos. The men had new leadership that they didn't like, and there was a rebellion in the ranks, but Palmer eventually was able to quell that. Um, as one soldier lamented, Captain Palmer was not there to say, it's all right, boys, come on. Uh, towards the end of the war, uh, the end of the warriors would see them at the battles of Chattanooga, Lookout Mountain, and Chickamauga, which is where I encountered uh, Palmer in the south. Uh, and towards the end of the war, they chased Jefferson Davis um, across the South Carolina and Georgia, eventually capturing his treasury wagon. This is a picture of the guys on Lookout Mountain, uh, which is a place that I've been able to hike. Throughout these adventures, Palmer and McAllister gained experience in keeping track of both people and things, which would prove valuable skills in the mundane work of finding a city. For a time, McAllister was in charge of filling out ordinance reports. Have any of you ever filled out ordinance reports for the military? Well, I bet it's a pretty boring job. Um, in May of 1863, he recorded that the cavalry had seen, had received 43 cavalry sables, 43 cartridge boxes, and 46 saddles. And through his reports, we get a picture of what the troop was facing. In 1863, he reported the loss of equipment and horses from four members who were captured by the enemy. And he also had a bit of a sense of humor. Towards the end of the war, McAllister started getting rather terse in his reports. Uh, there's this question, I mean, most of the questions on those reports are how many sabers, you know, how many sabers did you receive? How many saddles did you receive? One of the questions was, would not Japan buckles be better than blued ones to look neater? I guess someone in the military like has a sense of fashion and they want their guys to look nice. And like McAllister fills these out and fills these out and finally he just starts answering that question immaterial. Like this has nothing to do with anything that we're doing here. Um, if McAllister was in charge of the company's assets, Palmer was in charge of taking care of the men themselves. He knew his men well and recommended them for promotion as he deemed appropriate, two skills that would serve him well in picking people to helm his future colony. On June 21st, 1865, the 15th Pennsylvania as an organization ceased to exist, thereafter only to be a memory, ending its service at Nashville, Tennessee. After the war, most of the men returned to civilian life. They became judges, bankers, lawyers, and farmers. Palmer would later remark, since the close of the war, with very few exceptions, they or their survivors have borne an honorable record in civil life. According to Francis Pearson, a lifelong bond had formed between Palmer and the men of his 15th. His true qualities of leadership, formed in that wartime crucible, were so well demonstrated that he could count on the unwavering loyalty of his comrades thereafter. That was Palmer's genius for organizing and getting things done. He inspired men in his quiet, unassuming way, and they responded by doing the impossible for the general whenever circumstances dictated. 
Far away in the West, in late April 1865, the news of the surrender of Lee and the end of the Civil War reached Colorado City, about two weeks after the occurrence. The people were so overjoyed to hear of the end of the great strife that they grilt a great bonfire on the hill to the north of town to celebrate. So can you imagine not knowing that the war was over for two weeks? Um, the years following the war were extremely good for the Colorado Territory. According to Eugene Berwanger, if the Civil War signaled the coming into existence of Colorado, the ensuing years witnessed growth even more important for the territory. With the end of the Civil War, Colorado experienced a resurgence in its economy in the areas of mining and railroading. In 1869, Palmer became a significant figure in this economic resurgence. After the war, Palmer returned to his career in railroading, joining the transcontinental railroad effort. He worked for the Kansas Pacific, which was supposed to link up with the Union Pacific and Nebraska. The skills that he learned in the war, like how to ride a horse, uh, how to survey the land, and how to quickly assess the available resources, um, came in quite handy in this job. The American West that Palmer explored on the job had been great, greatly impacted by the war, too. According to historian Oscar Lewis, perhaps the most far-reaching in its consequence was the part the war played in ending the region's isolation from the rest of the nation. The entrepreneurial spirit that Palmer showed in 1861 when he raised his Anderson troop stayed with him his entire life. By the late 1860s, he had found a desirable railroad route through Colorado that he wanted the Kansas Pacific to take. The Kansas Pacific wasn't interested in this, and he decided that he was going to build that route himself. Um, during this period, he also decided to start improving himself. He wrote his fiance Queen, when I went into the war, I never expected to come back, and when having seen better men fall around me everywhere, I came out with a scratch. I carried into civil life a good deal of the fatalism of the soldier. But my creed always has been and always will be better than my practice. But hereafter I am determined that they shall be made nearer to square, not by lowering the former, but by bringing up the latter. On a survey trip in July of 1869, he first encountered the Pikes Peak region. As he rode atop a carriage in the warm night air, he saw the moonlight shining on the face of Pikes Peak, and he fell in love with the region. He very quickly began to dream of building his home here and having a colony here and having his railroad run, run right through the area. This railroad would be staffed with his best friends from the war who he trusted completely. This vision was part of a larger colony movement going on in the aftermath of the war. A special pioneer edition of the El Paso County Democrat would later observe, of the colony plan of immigration, General Palmer stated that the period following the war, 1865 to 1873, was in the United States and especially in the West, one of noticeable cooperative activity. He attributes this largely to the fact that so many men from different sections, states, and neighborhoods had become acquainted with one another during the war and had learned to work and act together and thousands had been obliged to organize companies and regiments and to carry on executive business on a considerable scale and under difficult surroundings. One of the colony um, backers was a guy named N.C. Meeker, who was trying to find a location for his colony. Palmer tried to recruit him to locate the colony here at the base of Pikes Peak, ostensibly trying to get Meeker to do the work for him. Meeker thought about it, but pronounced the water too scarce for any agricultural development, and he would end up finding his colony up in northern Colorado, what is now known as Greeley. Forced to do the work of planting the colony himself, Palmer did what he had done in 1861. He recruited a team of men to help him achieve his goals. According to Barbara Gately, Palmer's ability to handpick reliable lieutenants, demonstrated in his military years, was well known among his business associates. The wartime bond that Palmer had formed with his men uh, remained strong, and he would eventually convince 16 of them, including Henry McAllister, to join him in the effort. The friendship that Palmer had formed with McAllister remained strong into the war years. McAllister had returned to Philadelphia to work for American Iron and Steel Association. They both attended each other's weddings and stayed in touch. Palmer asked McAllister to serve as the president of the National Land and Improvement Company, which was in charge of acquiring land for the Denver and Rio Grande. Numerous other veterans were involved with the Fountain Colony from the very beginning. According to McAllister, Territorial Governor Hunt, who was the U.S. Marshal of the territory, had long regarded the plateau below the Pikes Peak as an ideal location for a settlement. Hunt sent El Paso County Clerk Irving Halbert, who had served with the 3rd Colorado, Calvary in the Indian Wars and to help. 
and he acquired 9,312 acres of land for the colony at the cost of just a little over a dollar per acre. Hunt also hired General Robert Cameron, who we have a picture of as an older man and as in the Civil War. Um, he served with three different Indiana regiments, and he became the first manager of the Fountain Colony. When Palmer traveled to Mexico in 1872, he invited McAllister out to look after things. McAllister arrived in the middle of winter and did not think that the colony looked very promising. He would end up staying here and making it a very livable place. He and his wife, Elizabeth, built the first substantial house in town, making use of the talents of a certain young carpenter named Linfield Scott Stratton. His wartime experience of keeping track of things and people made him the ideal colony supervisor. McAllister was eventually elected to the town board of trustees and served as the president of the board from 1875 to 1877. He served as the executive director of the Colorado Springs Company until 1879, and he also planted 5,000 cottonwood trees, raised money for schools and libraries, and planned an irrigation ditch. So all of the work that he had done in the war by keeping track of things certainly helped pay off. In addition to the genteel colonists and the health seekers, the growing settlement of what became known as Colorado Springs attracted a lot of Civil War veterans from both sides of the conflict. You have to remember that in this period, pretty much everyone had been touched by the war in some way, shape, or form. The vast majority of these old soldiers who had, had fought for the Union, but there were a few who had fought for the South too. Most noticeably on the Southern side was Margaret, Hayes, Margaret Davis Hayes, the daughter of Jefferson Davis, she moved her family to Colorado Springs in search of a dry climate that would be beneficial for her husband's asthma. She became a well-known figure in the community and many of her descendants still live in the region. From the Union Army came men such as Otis Rimick of the 1st and 11th Wisconsin regiments. He had moved to Colorado Springs in 1881 for his wife's health, as many other people did. He had served as a provost marshal in New Orleans and brought a sense of responsibility and good citizenship westward. He became active in the community, serving as a representative of Northwestern Mutual Life and teaching Sunday school at the First Congregational Church. His funeral program would proclaim, no worthy measure in civil affairs, church, or society failed to receive his hearty commendation. Rimmick also served as the post historian for the newly organized Colorado Springs chapter of the Grand Army of the Republic. Founded in 1866 in Illinois, the GAR brought together veterans of the Union Army. Robert Cameron had actually founded a chapter of his own in Greeley before he came to Colorado Springs. Local Post 22 was founded in 1882 and Manitou and Colorado City each had their own chapters. In 1895, Stratton had a folio of personal war sketches bound for Post 22. And we have a lot of memories of these individual soldiers of their time during the war. In the book, Rimmick noted the intimate connection between the war and the founding of Colorado Springs, stating pretty explicitly, the founders of Colorado Springs were men who had served in the Union Army. He later went on to say that it wasn't until 11 years after the founding of Colorado Springs that they decided to actually count how many veterans were in town. I think it's interesting that they waited so long to do this, and I'm wondering if there were just so many veterans in town that nobody really thought anything about it until they were trying to get them all together to form an organization. They called a meeting and organized the local chapter of the GAR. Commander E.K. Stinson organized the post and installed the officers with the 18 charter members representing nine different states in the conflict. The Grand Army of the Republic and other veterans organizations allowed their survivors to pay homage to their wartime service and to continue doing good for the community. The Post observed Decoration Day in 1883 and held an encampment in July. The following year, they hosted GAR chapters from Colorado, Wyoming, and New Mexico on the west side of Cascade Avenue. On this particular encampment, the men pitched tents across from the high school. They held a parade, they held a sham battle, and a barbecue and a church service. Um, in July of 1889, they hosted General William T. Sherman, who had come to Colorado to participate in a 4th of July celebration in Denver. They were able to lure him down here to the south. They organized a reception for him in the Antlers Hotel and drove him around Cheyenne Canyon. Uh, Jacob Reed, who was the surgeon of the post, also donated plots of land to each of the GAR members um, for when they were buried. 
McAllister was a member of the GAR, but Palmer never did join. Um, he, he resisted joining veterans organizations because they were too warlike for him, and he wanted to enjoy peace. Um, but the other members of the GAR were prominent citizens who were active participants in the life of Colorado Springs, such as David Heron of the 5th Iowa Infantry, who organized the Exchange National Bank, and David Heiser, who was a principal organizer of the town of Cascade, a member of the Chamber of Commerce and the director of the Colorado Springs National Bank. So a lot of the institutions that we still have in town were founded by Civil War veterans. In 1889, Benjamin Steele published an article in the Gazette to accompany some of the biographical sketches of the GAR members. He stated, it is little we can do to adequately show our gratitude for what they did in the War of the Rebellion. We hardly re realize that in our midst are representatives of nearly every hard fought battle of the rebellion. It seems appropriate, therefore, that their neighbors should know something of what these men did. It would be especially valuable to the rising generation who are either too young or who have been born since to study this history in a way that will impress them. Um, although Palmer never did join the GAR, the Civil War remained a really important part of his life. He continued to use his field title of general throughout his career, and he would later take his daughters to Chattanooga to see where he had fought. In 1906, Palmer suffered a riding accident that left him paralyzed. Unable to travel to the reunion of his beloved 15th Pennsylvania, he decided to bring everyone out here. So he sent a train car to pick up 100 members of the Pennsylvania um, to bring them out here to Colorado Springs. Uh, we have a guy named James Weir who kept a diary of the account, and he talks about uh, look, seeing General Palmer for the first time in a long time, and they all pass in review by him, and General Palmer gives them all a salute. Um, Palmer also invited them out to Glen Airy, where he showed them moving pictures, which is probably the first time they had ever seen anything like that. They had picnics, they got to see Cave of the Winds, and they just generally enjoyed their time out here. Um, we are also encountered Mrs. Davis Hayes, and uh, he writes that he congratulated her on being able to enjoy a united country for the hatchet lies buried in the general's hospitality of friendship, to which she replies, yes, I guess so. <laughs> Um, after Palmer's death in 1909, the survivors of the Pennsylvania, 15th Pennsylvania dedicated a bronze plaque in his honor. So as we look ahead at our program of military matters in the Pikes Peak region, I think it's important to note that Colorado Springs has always had a military presence. There have always been war veterans here from day one of the colony. As we welcome our troops home at Fort Carson and Pete Field and Shriver, I think it's important to remember that Colorado Springs was founded by men just like them, people who have returned home from a war, um, except this war was 150 years ago. The American West and the Pikes Peak region specifically served as a kind of safety valve for these veterans, a safety valve that we don't really have today. I mean, we don't really have colony movements going on today. But back then, the West served as a place for them to remake themselves, to reinvent themselves, and to take their wartime experiences and translate those into nation building. Palmer was able to take the skills that he learned commanding a regiment and translate those into picking able men who were able to build a city and a railroad. He was able to capitalize on the network of comrades that he had made during the war as he recruited settlers to the area. For Major McAllister, Remick, Heiser, Heron, and all of the other veterans, the sense of honor and responsibility that they learned during the war translated into organizing the city, establishing banks and institutions, and improving votes themselves and the area. The founding of Colorado Springs really could have only happened in those special time, the six years after the Civil War, being influenced by the war and reconstruction and looking ahead to the future.